Hello and welcome everybody to this colloquium on open democracy in the age of AI, how to make popular rule smarter and more accessible. My name is John Tosulis and I'm the director of Oxford's Institute for Ethics in AI. Popular views about the relationship between democracy on the one hand and AI, the internet and digital technologies generally on the other have wildly oscillated over time. In an earlier period, there was a prominent strain of thought according to which these technologies would help usher in a kind of utopia, potentially global in scope, grounded in digitally enhanced interconnectedness and solidarity on the one hand, and digitally enhanced capabilities for sound deliberation about the common good on the other. In more recent times, however, this utopian vision has been displaced by its darker alter ego, with AI and digital technologies now perceived as posing potentially fatal threats to democracy, whether through the spread of disinformation and the manipulation of individuals via micro-targeting, the formation of echo chambers that aggravate political polarization and corrode deliberation geared towards the common good, or the threat to basic liberties posed by the ominous growth of surveillance capitalism and governmental surveillance, the two kinds of surveillance often working hand in hand. Beyond this oscillation on the question of the impact of AI and digital technology on democracy, there is perhaps a deeper question. And that's the question, what is democracy and why value it in the first place? For many thinkers, the distinctive value of human beings, the locus of our human dignity, lies in our capacity for rational autonomy, for rationally weighing up the pros and cons of a range of options and choosing or accepting the option that seems best. Democracy, the system of popular self-government in which all have an equal opportunity to participate in political deliberation and decision-making is perhaps the highest communal expression of our dignity as rational agents. Our main speaker today, Professor Ellen Landmore of Yale University, is one of the foremost thinkers about how democracy might be reconfigured for the digital age. She's the author of Democratic Reason, published by Princeton in 2013, and of Open Democracy, published by Princeton very recently. Helen has argued that the dominant representative model of democracy, dominant in both theory and in practice, is a child of the conceptual, epistemological, and technological constraints of the 18th century. She believes that developments in AI and digital technology more generally can help us realize a more attractive democratic ideal, which she calls open democracy. This ideal gives less emphasis, far less emphasis to the role of elites, professional politicians, judges, and so forth in political decision-making. The aim of this ideal, says Hélène, is, and I quote, to put ordinary citizens at the center of the political system rather than at the periphery, emphasizing accessibility and equality of access to power over mere consent to power and delegation of power to elected elites. Paradoxically then for Ellen, AI and digital technology opens up the prospect of a more radically participatory form of democracy, bringing us closer to the prototype in classical Athens. I'm really delighted to welcome Ellen and thank her very much for accepting our invitation. I'm also delighted to welcome two distinguished commentators. First, Professor Pratap Banu Mehta, who is university professor and professor of political science at Ashoka University. He is, in my view, one of the profoundest contemporary political thinkers in the world today, and author, among other things, of the classic book, The Burden of Democracy, published by Penguin in 2003. Our second commentator is Oxford's Professor Andrew Briggs, who impressively straddles the science-humanities divide. He's a professor of nanomaterials who uses machine learning in his own research. He is one of the co-authors of an important report published earlier this year 
entitled Citizenship in a Networked Age, an Agenda for Rebuilding Our Civic Ideals. Thank you to both Pratap and Andrew. I just want to remind you that there will be a question, a question and answer session, Q&A session towards the end. So please, if you have any questions, and I hope you will, use the comment function on YouTube. But now I'm delighted to turn over to Professor Landmore. Alain. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Tazulas, for this wonderful opportunity. I am very grateful to the commentators as well, Professor Meta, with whom I once took a class at Harvard University and have very much looked up to since then, and Professor Briggs, who I'm so pleased to meet and look forward to learning from. So I was tasked to offer some thoughts about the relationship between my vision for a better, more authentic form of democracy, which I call open democracy, and artificial intelligence, which I take to be the intelligence of machines building on algorithms and the vast amount of data now av available in the world. The relationship between open democracy and AI is not obvious because on the face of it, open democracy, which I, I construe as a new paradigm of democracy, indeed, as uh, Professor Tazulias mentioned, it aims to put the ordinary citizen at the center of political decision-making, specifically lawmaking, has nothing to say about artificial intelligence per se. Open democracy is a model of governance that could exist at, in any age, not just the age of AI. And initially I wasn't sure that artificial intelligence posed either a unique threat or offered a unique promise to open democracy compared to say the threat or promise it represents for a classic representative democracy or any other regime form. At any rate, in the paper I shared with the commentators, which is part of a volume on digital technologies and democratic theory, I co-edited with uh, Rob Reich and Lucy Bernholtz from Stanford University, I choose to look at digital technology and by extension AI as a positive force, something that can actually help us implement a functional, digitized, scalable version of an open democracy at the local, national and transnational levels and perhaps in a purely digital and deterritorialized version. I engage in a bit of science fictional creative writing in this paper. I, I envision, for example, the way Facebook could be repurposed as a global democratic citizen book where everyone could seek information, educate themselves, vote on issues ranging from the local to the global, enter into virtual deliberative rooms with randomly selected strangers to become exposed to truly diverse views, and um, perhaps create the foundations of a global democracy. For all of that, I could see AI as a sort of a way to augment the potential of, um, of open democracy. But there's another deeper, in a way, more philosophical kind of connection that I thought up since uh, I was invited to, to speak on the topic, which is simply the idea of collective intelligence. After all, open democracy, as I see it, is premised on the belief that deliberation amongst free and equals generates legitimate laws and policies in part because these laws and policies are likely to be smarter than those produced by any other kind of process, especially less inclusive, less egalitarian and less deliberative ones. That's why I wrote my book, Democratic Reason First, with the, the epistemic case for democracy, I kind of needed to understand the, 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 the institutional principle that an authentic democracy uh, should be based on. So the paradigm of open democracy is, in my view, a more equal and inclusive regime form than a representative democracy as we know it. And as a result, it's also likely to be a smarter one because it taps the collective intelligence of all the members of the group through both deliberative and aggregative procedures. But then, of course, the idea of AI, the, 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 the the existence of AI raises the question, what about a regime that would similarly tap the collective intelligence of its group, of the demos, uh, but without any actual formal deliberations amongst them, without voting, and simply through the harvesting of data and the processing of that data by deep neural networks. If AI, as we now know, can beat the best human being at chess or Go, as it does now, uh, why couldn't AI beat democracies? even open ones at politics. In what follows, I explore three separate questions uh, or three separate types of relations between open democracy and AI. I, uh, of course, hasten to say that I don't have definite answers to those questions, but simply uh, tentative thoughts. 
So the first one is um, the role of artificial intelligence in augmenting or threatening democracy, specifically open democracy. The second one is uh, the question of whether open democracy can control and regulate the use of AI, for example, on uh, difficult questions such as you know, self-driving cars and, and the ethical principles that they raise. And finally, I turn to this fascinating question uh, of the potential competition between what one might call rule by artificial intelligence, if it is indeed possible, and rule by the deliberating many, which is uh, my preferred option. Which one would win? First, let me clarify what I mean by open democracy, in part by contrast with representative democracy. Representative democracy is basically electoral or party democracy as we, we've known it since the 18th century. It uh, centers periodic elections whereby we consent to the exercise of power by others on our behalf and for our sake. In the 18th century, indeed, we decided that um, ruling had to be performed by a political class of people with the will, aptitudes, and competence and virtue to make decisions on our behalf. We eventually came to call this regime form, initially um, designed against democracy and variously called instead republic or representative government democracy, because uh, it's true that in it, we are given a choice of rulers on the egalitarian and inclusive basis of one person, one vote. So it's not really people's power, let alone ruled by the people uh, in any really deep and meaningful sense in my view, but still, it's much better than what came before. It gives us some choice, allows us to have a say, allows us to sanction rulers we don't like or, didn't, or who didn't do well for us. This kind of regime is premised on popular consent and the ideal of popular sovereignty. It corresponds, or at least it did for a while, to an equalization of conditions in the social sphere that has been very empowering uh, for all or at least most. But what if we really cared about this ideal of people's power the ideal of rule by the people, not just of or for the people, or in other words, the ancient ideal of ruling and being ruled in turn, really exercising power. Argue that if we did, then we'd want a new kind of regime form that distributes power equally amongst all, not just the limited power of choosing decision makers or sanctioning them, but the actual power of making the laws and policies that govern us. That's what I see as authentic self-rule, authentic democracy. Um, I also argue that this regime form need not be and cannot be in fact of the direct kind in the sense of having all of us, millions of people at once making decisions together on all possible issues. Assembly democracy is just not a feasible way to run a country anymore. And democracy has to depend on a division of labor between rulers and ruled. Um, even as this division of labor need not be established in an inegalitarian and exclusive uh, fashion that closes off the spaces of power to the vast majority of the population, as is the case now. In other words, democracy needs to be a representative. In fact, for me, the expression representative democracy is redundant and uninformative, if you will. But it does not have to be so on the historical model we call, quote unquote, representative democracy. Instead, what we can have is the practice of what I describe as representing and being represented in turn democratically, whereas, whereby the, the representation at stake is distributed equally to all. Um, and the only way to achieve this, I argue, is via lottery or random selection. At the center of my imagined system of open democracy, the key institution is what I call the open mini public, a body of a few hundred randomly selected citizens in charge of setting an agenda for the country and even making the law in connection with a larger public uh, via a network of satellite mini publics and other forms of citizen participation, including in fine mass referenda and, and moments of direct democracy, because we still need those moments of, uh, of, of immediate participation. So you can think of it as, a, as this open mini public as a supersized jury in charge of providing a vision for the polity and sketching the laws for it, uh, not writing them all together. This sounds um, very utopian in some respect, but there are um, um, versions of, or proto versions of, of elements of that vision already in place in certain countries. The, the, the example that comes closest to this is actually not Iceland, although it's uh, one of my favorite case studies, but um, Ostbelgian, uh, so in, in, uh, in the German speaking region of, 
of Belgium, um, the local parliament has decided to um, appoint, uh, establish a, a, a randomly selected body of uh, 27 citizens who basically set the agenda, make recommendations that the parliament has committed to following. And they also have the power, this, uh, this, this council of, of 27 randomly selected citizens of convening uh, three times a year uh, or three times over the, the length of their, their, their um, uh, term, citizens assemblies on specific topics. So it's an idea that's uh, actually already uh, out there. The recent um, uh, report by the uh, OECD uh, called the Catching the Deliberative Wave documents, 289 examples of such mini publics. And so I think that um, if you want, I, I, I pride myself in doing what I call inductive political theory. So these are not just um, visions pulled out of thin air, but really um, uh, built on actual practice and observation of actual experiments on the ground. Open democracy, as I see it, is built after five distinctive institutional principles that differentiate it as a whole from either ancient democracy, from which it borrows some features, or modern representative democracy. Uh, these five principles are participation rights, by which I mean not just voting rights, but all kinds of methods that cut a path open from the periphery to the center of power, such as rights of referral, citizens' initiatives, uh, ways to give the to put the ball in the camp of, of citizens, give them the initiative. The fourth principle is um, uh, the third principle is the majority principle. The fourth principle is deliberation. Um, uh, the fourth principle is democratic representation. And the fifth principle is transparency. Sorry, I got the numbering wrong, but there are five principles in total. Thus, open democracy, as I envision it, is a form of popular rule where the center of power, which is to my mind the legislative power, is maximally accessible or open to ordinary citizens. You have to imagine nurses, farmers, accountants, students, men and women, whites and blacks, Muslims and Christians, old and young, articulate and bold, as well as shy and introverted people that are all equally welcome to contribute to uh, ordinary law and the laws and policies that shape their, their life in common. So once that model is uh, established, how can artificial intelligence in augment or threaten open democracy? Um, there are various ways in which AI, I think, could uniquely empower a system of open democracy, especially when it comes to deliberation. Uh, Internet AI, as it's often called, can, could considerably improve the quality of deliberation in uh, an open mini public, uh, in particular. It would help participants in these deliberative bodies avail themselves of the best evidence. Um, it would help them vote better by synthesizing relevant uh, evidence perhaps dispelling fake news. Um, it would help also decision makers manage expectations by giving them a fine grained picture of the state of public opinion. Uh, it would help process the amount, amount of data that, that uh, bureaucracies are, 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 are able to provide. Autonomous AI uh, in turn could help facilitate conversation amongst, amongst participants because one of the big, um, uh, difficulties with this uh, large scale uh, deliberative bodies is that in order for deliberation to be conducted properly, you often need to have facilitators at each table, sometimes table as small as six people. And the, the, this is often dispositive for, for small or local communities because it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's very expensive to pay people to perform that job. And for example, even the recent French Convention for Climate, which had a huge budget of over 5 million euros, gave up on having facilitators at each table over the duration of the, of the whole experiment because it was simply too costly. Um, additionally, human facilitation can be very uneven. Uh, and so that poses question of fairness um, between, between participants. So an example uh, of AI that could be useful is, for example, what Jim Fishkin has developed um, in the context of his deliberative poll. It apparently created a, an algorithm he calls Alice, uh, who's capable, apparently, of handling the deliberations of, uh, of large groups. Now, the threats are, I think, relatively uh, well known and, and discussed already. Uh, artificial intelligence has been used by bad actors to sow confusion in public debates. Um, we 
talked a lot about the problem of deep fakes, the, the, the question of micro-targeted voters who um, are only exposed to ads and, and a kind of propaganda that basically manipulates their, their decision making and takes away their agency. There's the question of the kind of addiction to entertainment that uh, AI can be used to foster, as opposed to encouraging people to really become properly informed. And it's true that AI used that way can dilute any sense of a common world and the belief that truth is something that, that's meaningful for one thing and can then that we can converge on. And if we don't have those basic things, a belief in truth, uh, uh, the means to achieve it, uh, uh, to, 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 um, to potentially converge on it, then I think democracy becomes very difficult because deliberation becomes pointless. Uh, and as already mentioned uh, in the introduction I, uh, by Professor Tassiulias, I, I think we're currently in a dystopian phase of our attitude towards AI. That said, it's also um, the fact that we are at the peak of our disillusion towards our forms of governance. And what this suggests to me is coincidence between the dystopian moment towards AI and the dystopian uh, and the frustration with our system is that perhaps the causal arrow goes the other way. It's not so much that AI is destroying democracy, is that democracy is fostering a bad use of AI and that if only we had a more robust, healthier, truer form, more deliberative form of democracy, perhaps AI, which in the end, at the end of the day is just a neutral scientific object, could be put to better purposes because the incentives would be there. Um, and, and I think they are lacking currently in our system, which rewards the wrong kind of behavior. Um, so let me turn now to the second theme I want. Second theme I wanted to talk about, which is uh, open democracy as a way to control AI, or the use of AI. Um, my belief is that a functional democracy, where people are working toward a common vision of the good, encountering diversely thinking people regularly, seeing a direct relationship between what they vote for in referenda and what they get in terms of public policies and laws would probably not be so vulnerable to um, bad AI, to conspiracy theories, to polarization, to micro-targeting. Um, conversely, um, I think that AI becomes a threat where open democracy principles are lacking, such as uh, a right for the people affected by AI to participate in the formulation of the ethics, ethical principles encoded in its, in its algorithms where deliberation about those principles is lacking or where transparency about how the choices um, were made or are going to be made is lacking. So all these principles that are essential to my definition of open democracy, I think that if we really took them seriously and institutionalized them, we'd be less vulnerable to, to, to bad AI. For example, on the perennial question of the uh, ethical principle that should be encoded in the algorithm of self-driving cars, I, I find that in the conversation, it's often a, a debate between those who advocate for the sort of techno utilitarianism of the Chinese approach. What we do is calculate the number of lives we save on the whole when we replace normal cars with self-driving cars versus the rights-based American approach where we only proceed if we can minimize the death tolls, the, de the death toll caused by self-driving cars, regardless of the comparative costs. And it seems to me that that's a wrong debate to have. I think there's a procedurally right answer to this, which is to only encode in the algorithms, the value judgments that result from a deliberative democratic process among the citizens themselves or their democratic representatives, by which I would mean not elected ones, but lotocratic ones. And the results might vary depending on the cultural context or they may converge. We don't know yet because it's never really been tried as I believe. Um, I was reading a, a fascinating study of, of the priorities observed in different regions of the world through a process of crowdsourcing, uh, a sort of a global survey of what people would answer to questions of, you know, um, uh, ethical priorities. Would you prefer that the car kills uh, the pedestrian who is jaywalking or uh, uh, two pedestrians who are jaywalking or you know, one pedestrian who was uh, respecting the law? Um, should we privilege uh, women, uh, children, uh, high status individuals, etc.? cetera? And, and results are, are quite fascinating. Apparently, thousand countries tend to want to encode principles that prioritize the protection of women, children, but also high status individuals. Western regions tend to privilege the number of people. Eastern regions want to preserve pedestrians. Germans tend to want to preserve the lawful, so those who don't jaywalk, more than China does, for example. 
so it's fascinating, uh, fascinating sort of variation, uh, sometimes also disturbing. And I think at the end, AI ethics, the kind that's encoded in our in our uh, in our practices in our, in our technologies, need to reflect the values of a given country as democratically and deliberatively identified by the members of that country. So I'm not endorsing the use of those kind of global surveys to, to, to know, justify certain principles, because I think that's too raw and too um, non-deliberative a process to, to measure what people really want. Um, but I, even with a deliberative step introduced in the process, there would still be major discrepancies between countries as to what they deem morally acceptable or not. And what that says to me is that um, a democratic AI should you know, change the algorithm or the, the, the coding of the algorithm at the, at the national boundaries. And maybe on some global issues, we need to have a, a global average, uh, perhaps on climate change or on, on other things. On, on, um, but these are, these are questions that I, I would like to see discussed more. And I, right now, I always feel like this is a debate between utilitarian versus rice-based. And when I think it's, it should be about the procedure that we um, use to get to these conclusions. Let me turn to the last point about the competition between an open democracy and rule by AI, which is the more fun perhaps and the more uh, science fictional. It's a parallel that I think is worth exploring because in my theory of open democracy, in my arguments for it deep down, there is the belief that giving maximum access to um, all the rich human diversity of a given demos when it comes to deliberating about the law, will result in the production of a collective intelligence that is greater than that of any subgroup in the demos. I even used, I believe, the metaphor of uh, brains all seamlessly connected to each other to refer to the conditions for that collective intelligence to emerge. In fact, I, I even used another metaphor, that of all, all brains in a jar. But the colleague I was talking to when I used that phrase uh, was too horrified, so I, I've stopped using it. But it's, it's this idea that we just, we just aim to, to really connect our our, our computing power as human beings, our creative power, our imaginative power, and, and build solution that way. What if then artificial intelligence is in some sense better than this, better than all human brains connected to each other, better than collective, but in the end flawed, limited human intelligence? Um, and here, there are people like Martin Hilbert at UC Davis who um, uh, used to advocate, I'm not sure he's doing it still, but what they call DDNN, Deep Democracy Neural Net, whereby he proposes to replace Congress, to replace Congress with a neural net that's better at identifying the common will of the group than any human being or group of human beings, whether elected or randomly selected. The method is this, you ask citizens all over the country to write a page about what they think the right policy is on, on an issue, say education or taxation, or you ask them to record in their phone a 15 minute memo about what's important to them, or you have them send texts on topics of various uh, you know, uh, interests, uh, even very short ones. And then you throw all of that information into a deep neural network. And the idea is that it would spit out some kind of recommendation about uh, what we should legislate about and how. There are obvious problems with this, uh, in my view, uh, from the get-go, if you will, is if we care about certain values and principles of open democracy, but in fact, I think democracy more generally, such as equality, deliberation, and transparency. These values and principles are not clearly embedded in the model of uh, a, a deep democracy neural net. In fact, it's um, it's, it's 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 hardly a democracy uh, by you know uh, in a meaningful sense of the term. Equality, for example, is not verified. There's no guarantee that everyone's preference or point of view is given equal weight. We don't know how the the AI weighs a page versus a voice memo versus a text. Um, the principle of deliberation is also not uh, respected. The most the model the model is mostly very good at tracking what society wants at time t, but it's not based on a society-wide deliberation of any kind. So we don't know if there's been a, a genuine engagement with arguments for and against a particular view. Uh, and we still lack at the end of the day, um, the legitimizing power of reasons. How, once we get the, the, the policy recommendation that the AI comes up with, how, what are the reasons for these recommendations? How do we articulate Th those in terms that humans can understand. Finally, transparency is lacking. Uh, 
there's, there cannot be any transparency if no one understands how the artificial intelligence got from the input it was fed to the policy recommendation it spits out. Perhaps uh, a solution would be so-called self-explaining AI, so artificial intelligence get, that can provide um, an explanation of how it went from A to Z. But even this will be self-explanatory or explanatory, mostly to the high priesthood of engineers running the system, not ordinary citizens. Accountability, which is uh, another concern one might have, even though it's not to me strictly a democratic value, but more of a guarantee that the system is not corrupt and functions for the people rather than against them, is not guaranteed either. What if simply there's a bug in the code, whether it's planted by an evil party or overlooked by engineers? Uh, because at the end of the day, again, it's, it's a cliche to say this probably, but for, as for any technology, eventually the AI is only as good as the engineers who designed it. There's a real question though, which is if we focus um, solely on the purely uh, outcome oriented question on, on the good governance question, right? Can AI beat human beings at solving problems? Uh, can it do better than, than a democracy? Personally, I think AI rule would only be possible or better on narrowly defined issues. Figuring out, for example, the optimal tax rate on certain goods or uh, certain things, given society's preferences in terms of justice, equality, or freedom, if those could be really neatly quantified. But general AI, I believe, if it's really ever uh, uh, successful, I don't think will ever be the capacity of human beings to generate solutions to common problems, because ultimately, at least from what I understand, and I'm happy to stand corrected if need be, AI is past oriented. It identifies unobserved correlations in the data that no human could hope to spot, but it's not capable of authentic creativity. It cannot deal with the new, the unpredictable, the radically uncertain. So unless we live in fact in the matrix, a fully deterministic world of sorts, I just don't see how machines are ever going to beat us at handling political issues, which to me are essentially defined by two features. They have to do with our life in common and they have a dimension of unpredictability, at least as a bundle. And that's where humans have an advantage, creativity, the possibility of envisioning what has never been envisioned before and making it happen. And I know some people might say, but AI is super creative at Go, for example. Um, it, beat the, the, it beat the best player in the last 5,000 years. It, it, it's sort of displayed a certain amount of um, uh, creativity and, and uh, in, in seemingly imagination. But Go again is based on, is a game that's based on a set of rules that are fixed and known. There's not that many degrees of freedom as I understand it. And I don't think the world of politics is like that. How do we solve climate change? How do we handle North South inequalities? How do we finally solve poverty in the world? How do we handle terrorism, global migrations? I don't, I, don't, I don't see how uh, an, an artificial intelligence can really address those, those big uh, questions. Ultimately, the more interesting question for me is therefore, is there a use of artificial intelligence to promote open democracy? Can artificial intelligence, which is quintessentially non-transparent in its logic, indeed even incomprehensible to even the engineers who design it, be safely built in the foundations of democracy? I'm not sure, um, but at the, any rate, I think democratic representatives, uh, the lotocratic kind in my model, could make use of AI technology to connect to the larger public. And one place where I could see a use for AI is, is indeed in really helping us process the mass of information that people are willing to give away in moments of massive consultation, like for example, the 2019 great national debate in France. So this great national debate uh, was a two month affair. Uh, it uh, resulted in 2 million online submissions, 100,000 pages of PDF, summarizing the content of grievance books written all over France, pages and pages of reports um, summarizing the results of 21 randomly selected regional assemblies. It was an enormous amount of data that was generated during this, this uh, winter of 2019. And yet, as far as I know, AI was not mobilized to study any of this. The methods, de the methods deployed were rather simple. It was word cloud, big data analysis, uh, knowledge trees, um, 
you know, methodologies that date back to the 60s. So what if the best mind turned to that instead of going to Facebook to help them generate better ads? Uh, my sense is that th there's real potential for AI there to, to basically offer us a better picture of who we are and, and, and where we stand on, on, on issues. The main threat to democracy right now seems to me um, economic imbalances that create skewed incentive for the deployment of talent rather than in the technology of AI itself. And I'll stop here and I, I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Yolanda. That was fantastic. Um, many, many very interesting issues covered there. So I'm going to turn next to our first commentator, who is Professor Mehta Patak. Um, thank you, John, for providing this wonderful forum and Ellen uh, for a brilliant presentation. Um, so, you know, with Flaubert once said that with universal suffrage, we'll all be happy. And clearly, uh, it turned out to be one form of happiness, but it did not make us as happy as we would like to be. And Elaine's work on open democracy is, I think, a brilliant and visionary answer to some of, um, I think, our concerns about the way um, electoral democracy based on universal suffrage has turned out, what some of its limitations uh, are. Uh, it opens up new vistas in democ democratic theory in ways that we have not seen for um, a, a few decades, actually. And in my brief remarks, I just want to focus on sort of two points, one on the kind of conceptual foundations of open democracy, and then use that to link it to uh, Elaine's discussion today uh, on AI, which I'm hearing for the first time. So I'll be making up one or two questions uh, on the go, as it were. So when we think of the dissatisfactions with current electoral representative democracy, uh, they usually fall around three or four principles. So when representative democracy works well, we usually have good peaceful transitions to power. Uh, it does embody a certain form of equality. We all at least have equal votes uh, or whatever that's worth. But on the core values and principles of democracy, uh, impartiality are the outcomes that we see in our democracies impartial, that free and equal people reasoning would agree to them. There are question marks, partly because these decisions are a result of partisanship under conditions of power asymmetry. Uh, Elaine has, I think, very brilliantly pointed out that the equality that electoral representative democracy promises us is a very thin equality. I mean, we do have the equal vote. But if you take the deeper meaning of equality, which is do we have an equal opportunity to participate in and influence the outcomes of policies that affect us, uh, the answer is probably no. Uh, this democracy is representative in the sense that the representatives are authorized by us, but is it representative in a deeper sense? Do our representatives in some senses look like us? Uh, would, I think this is Elaine's big gambit, uh, if you randomly chose uh, a mini public uh, uh, through a lotocratic uh, uh, means, would the deliberations of that kind of body be necessarily inferior, if not superior, to the deliberations of a elected body as we understand it? And I think Elaine has made a really persuasive case, at least I'm quite persuasive actually, that lotocratic representation on the one hand or some form of self-selected town hall, the kind of revival of sort of New England democracy where everybody just gathers together at the local level and it's representative of the population as a whole, actually does better than uh, uh, elected uh, uh, representative democracy on a number of these principles, equality, uh, impartiality, representation, and so forth. I think the only question I have about uh, I think Elaine's emphasis on lotocratic representation uh, is an old one, which is when we think of representation, we can think of it in two dimensions, right? Uh, we can look upon representation as does the representative assembly look like us? And in some senses, a randomly chosen uh, 
selection of people is more likely to represent the cognitive diversity of the population than our elected representatives do. But there is this older meaning of representation where what's important about representation is that our representatives come to be representatives through some act of mine, like voting, like authorization. And I think one of the worries about autocratic representation is that the one thing it underestimates is the agency dimension of representation. They look like me, but are they still mine? Or how would you choose in a sense between representation as authorization or representation as mirroring us? Now, if you take this agency dimension of democracy seriously, that it actually does matter to us, even if the decisions are bad and the representatives are not what we like them to be, they are, as it were, our, uh, ours. Then it poses a couple of interesting questions about the relationship between AI and democracy. And I think in particular one tension that I think was at least pronounced in Ellen's remarks today, although it's not there in her book. So think of John Stuart Mill or Habermas or any of the think classical thinkers of about deliberative democracy in some ways where there was a great confidence that if you protected people's rights, gave them equal access to a public sphere, some kind of adversarial contest over truth, right? Where people offer reasons, offer arguments, evidence, uh, some kind of adversarial process would in some senses be able to sort out the truth from the falsehood. And would also, if you were motivated in the right way, produce some kind of consensus among citizens, right? One of the interesting things that I think that has happened as a result of social media is the following. We seem to have less confidence that simply an open adversarial process of putting forth arguments and truth will, be able, will enable citizens to, as it were, sort out better arguments from worse arguments or better evidence from worse evidence. And one of the interesting reasons why people seem to want AI is that if it could somehow create a algorithm that could allow us to sort out fake news from real events as it were, if it somehow presented evidence in a better kind of way than our piecemeal fragmentary interventions uh, in public debate do, uh, perhaps we would actually become better reasoners, right? And I think this is one thing I think Alain seemed to suggest today in some ways that as this as one role for AI, uh, as it were, to help us facilitate us becoming better reasoners. Now, there is something attractive about this idea, but I would submit that it actually runs into at least the same question that lotographic representation does, which is uh, where is in a sense our own agency in us becoming better reasoners in some way? I mean, one, there is a question which I think Elaine is aware of and she rightly wants to embed these algorithms in the open democracy structure as well. They should be subject to accountability and stuff. But there is, I think, implicit uh, in the use of AI in that particular context a sort of lack of confidence that our adversarial cap capabilities for sorting out truth from falsehood uh, are perhaps less than most democratic theorists had assumed, right? So in that sense, AI performs a certain kind of regulatory function on public discourse, uh, or at least discourse within these mini republics. And I'm just wondering whether Elaine means that argument to come across as strongly as it does. Uh, I'm quite in agreement with her. I think that the place where AI has shown most promise, uh, I mean, there are these fantastic experiments, there's V Taiwan, there's lots of smart city experiments. Um, one just looks at the process of policymaking these days where governments can put out proposals. You can literally get hundreds of thousands of comments. And if you had a way of, in some senses, aggregating those comments, sorting um, uh, through them, use machine learning to make the most of them, uh, there is no question that that kind of information enhancement, right, could deeply 
deepen the quality of our deliberation. But I just worry that I think what we are expecting from AI, which is some kind of regulatory function on discourse, may actually turn out to be a little bit more problematic and perhaps anti-democratic um, than, than Elaine intends. And, and I think it goes against the spirit of, I think, Elaine's own proposal, uh, because one of its brilliance and I think most bold aspects is that I think she's willing to bite the bullet unlike many other theorists of democratic deliberation, which is where democratic deliberation is successful only if it produces the right answer that we know in advance in the first place. And I think Elaine's remarks to the, towards the end about possibly allowing a plurality of reasons and plurality out, of outcomes to flourish uh, suggests that she has a certain kind of openness, as it were, to that. And I think it'd be, I think, consistent with that spirit if perhaps there was less of a regulatory function on, on AI. I'll just make one last comment. I mean, there's so much to talk about in Elaine's paper. We could you know, discuss each of the ideas, but I'm running out of time. Um, so when we think of the risks of AI for democracy or technology in general, I think one of the features of political life over the last maybe few decades has been that technology seems to empower smaller groups of people to have disproportionate effects than they otherwise might have. I mean, that's what mass media did, for example, in the case of terrorism, just to take a sort of more controversial example, right? Uh, and most of, as it were, the pathologies of democracy that we see are actually do not stem from, in a sense, at least I'm personally not worried that they stemmed as much from majority rule. I think I'm with Elaine on this, right? It's more that both our institutions were, in a sense, designed to check majority rule. Uh, you might say checks and balances and the system of veto powers that we put into place. Uh, were designed in an era where actually the fear was majority rule, to be honest, right? Uh, but they were also designed in some ways to make sure that small groups of people did not have disproportionate effects on political life. And I just wonder if you have the kind of vision of deep interconnection that Elaine does, right? Whether actually that particular danger that you expose yourself to risk uh, um, I mean, that's the nice thing about the US system currently, right? So decentralized and chaotic that it's provided a certain kind of insurance. There's been more consensus on democratic procedures at the local level than perhaps at the national level. So how do you balance off um, in a way this trade-off between the risk of the disproportionate effects of small minorities that this deep interconnection of brains brings versus the benefits of collective um, cognitive intelligence. Uh, and finally, you know, one of the, I think the challenges and I think Elaine's own work has shown is that to me, the value of Elaine's work is that it has actually showed that we are prematurely pessimistic about deepening de deliberative democracy which is if you look at all of these examples, Iceland, uh, Taiwan, smart cities, forms of inclusive deliberation, that there's plenty to build on. But I think her work is also pointing out that you actually don't need a whole lot of technology to do that. I mean, I think what actually comes out is the fact that there is a commitment to politically recreating fora like town halls, uh, you know, sure, there's a little bit more sophistication on how you select citizens and so forth. And the beauty of those kinds of things is that they, in a sense, involve human agency. Uh, they reduce the insignificance of each individual actor. So not only do we want to enhance collective intelligence, we also want to make individual citizens mean that feel that they are less insignificant in this larger process. And I wonder whether on that question, AI actually makes us feel more or less insignificant. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Pratap. And now I'm gonna hand over to Professor Andrew Briggs. Andrew. 
I love what the three of you have already contributed. I, I love your approach, Elaine, because I, I love the way that you say there's no one thing called democracy and the kinds of democracies that we have now are a sort of um, legacy of this sort of inertial system we have of the technologies that were available centuries ago for implementing democracy. And let's, let's, let's wipe the whiteboard clean. And let's start all over again and think, you know, what should we design with the technologies that are available to us now? Uh, I love that. Uh, uh, after the um, Brexit referendum in the UK, I was involved in a conversation with two of Britain's leading AI entrepreneurs. And one of them, who was a very strong pro-European, was saying, ah, oh, roll on the day when these decisions are taken by machine learning, because then they'll take much better decisions. To which the reply was, uh, well, you know, the, the, the human brain um, has evolved for a very long time for good decision making. Um, so it does it quite well, uh, as if the human brain has sort of evolved in a way that 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 overcomes the constraints of the energy consumption and therefore the food needed and the size of the birth canal and so it has these different ways of thinking that uh, can process the information um that otherwise you'd need the vast computing power that's needed for for machine learning and um it seems to me that um that's not the whole story and in the uh report that, that um, John was kind enough to mention earlier on, two of the reasons that we give that democracy will need human involvement are first of all that humans are uniquely morally load-bearing and second that you need commitment to the decision. Now, uh, in, in my lab, um, I, I have a quantum technologies lab, so we're typically doing experiments at temperature of about a 50th of a degree above absolute zero, so colder than anywhere in the universe outside a laboratory. And uh, the machines take the decisions about the next measurement. So you can think of this as two changes uh, in artificial intelligence. Firstly, I mean, Artificial intelligence, deep neural networks have been used in material science for over 20 years. Most of the use has been for data classification and it's been successful because vast amounts of data were available to train on. And we're moving to uh, situations where the data are sparse and they're very costly to acquire. So we have to be good at AI with small amounts of data. But the other change that we're making is instead of classifying data that have been taken in the past, the machine is now deciding what are the next data that should be acquired. And already in uh, uh, some of our most difficult experiments, we're seeing more than a 10 time, a 10 fold speed up in how fast we can do the experiments on new samples that have not previously been investigated. And it's revolutionary and nobody wants to go back to doing it without the aid of machine learning. And in other fields, we're seeing the benefits of machine learning. So in medicine, there's now a growing number of empirical studies where the machines are better at diagnostic analysis of scans than humans are. So you can ask the question, you could start off with the question, would you prefer to be treated by a machine that knows less than your doctor? Well, that's easy. You say, no way. <laughs> so now you say, well, would you prefer to be treated by a doctor that knows less than your machine? Ah, oh, that's a bit of a harder question, you see. And so maybe you want to change the question and say, well, would you be preferred to be treated by a doctor who's using machine learning or a doctor who's not using machine learning? And we know too from empirical studies that there are inconsistencies in sentencing of courts. The issue became so um, apparent in the first 10 years of this century that parliament passed the act that created the Sentencing Council, which was formed in 2010, to introduce greater consistency in sentencing. Now, this is something that machines are rather good at, actually, because they can study all the literature, the, 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 the court reports, and they can study decisions that judges make in similar circumstances. So now you ask the question, Again, would you prefer to be um, 
have a sentence given by a machine that's less consistent than a judge. No way. Well, would you prefer to be sentenced by a machine, uh, by a judge that's less consistent than the machine? A bit harder, you see. And you can look back at how we tackled the question of medicine. So now you can think about um, democratic choices that I make. Um, you say, well, a democratic choice, that is a bit subtle, you know, because you're facing situations that haven't occurred before. And you may be choosing between between different options, neither of which you particularly like, but you want to find the one that's closest to what you would like. Well, there are big advances taking place in uh, multi-objective optimization. It's a branch of uh, Bayesian optimization. And also through um, uh, 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 um, techniques that are in the family of inverse reinforcement learning, machines can actually learn the values that I'm applying to decisions that I take. So now you can think, well, uh, would I want to avail myself of that sort of capability in my democratic participation? Well, um, of course, it's not all one way because the machines are working on me, not just potentially in my service. Um, and, uh, 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 well, I don't know if you noticed this morning, um, Laura Kunzberg commenting on the departure of Dominic Carlimings from, from, from Downing Street. Uh, observed that campaigns have to win, governments have to lead and persuade. And if we move to the sort of um, uh, open democracy that you're advocating, Elaine, that kind of distinction will change. And it may be that we have to, if it, if it really is a, a war between um, machine learning and, and, and humans, maybe we have to prepare for an arms race between the two. But if you're going to involve humans, what skills do they need? And, and again, drawing on the, on the research that we did for this um, report, we make seven recommendations. Anybody can find the report, just um, do a search on citizenship in a network page and you can find the website and download it. Um, two of the recommendations relate to this. One is humans need the ability to listen critically. The big data companies are paying some of the best minds in the world, some of the highest salaries in the world, to influence us. It's what you referred to, John, as the micro-targeting, and it's very effective. And it's going to get even more effective. And so humans are going to need the skill to be able to discern and to listen and to, uh, and, and to exercise their critical judgment on what the machines are feeding them. And the second one is the ability to reflect morally. Uh, you talked, John, about the, the echo chambers. One of the dangers of the networked age is that we isolate ourselves from people who would challenge us. And we need that if we're to refine our views. And this uh, moral reflection, um, it, it needs privacy because I need to get alone by myself if I'm going to reflect morally. I can't do that if I'm forever online. But, but not uh, privacy in isolation, because it, it, moral reflection is a communal effort, and it should be a communal effort in which we challenge one another. And uh, 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 as we advance these uh, machine learning technologies, and indeed, actually, uh, for that matter, many other technologies like gene synthesis and so on, although there are specific ethical questions for each specific technology, the deeper you go down in them, the more you come down to these bedrock questions of, 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 of what does it mean to be human? What are humans for? What does it mean for humans to flourish? Uh, and that needs um, reflection, it needs privacy, it needs community, and it needs challenging, and it needs different views that we should be exposed to. And I think, Elaine, I, I, I think you this is not news to you, because I, I see it in what you're writing and in what you're saying. That's why I warm to it so much. And thank you for what you're offering us. Thank you so much, Andrew. So... I'm going to unilaterally and undemocratically decide that we'll end at quarter past. Now, there's quite a few questions from the audience, Ellen, but I think you should have the opportunity just perhaps briefly to respond to some of the interesting issues that Pratap and Andrew have raised. <laughs> 
So thank you so much uh, uh, for these wonderful questions and comments. I, I just wanted to zoom in on, on the question that seems to be central in, in um, Pradap Mehta's comment. Um, this idea that maybe sortition takes away agency. And I, I'm, <laughs> I don't want a model of open democracy that, that takes away agency. I absolutely do not want that. It's just that um, for me, agency is in the first principle, participation rights, which ensure that there are moments of mass participation so that we have power uh, as a whole body in the here and now. But given that we can't have that too often and we need to think of representative um, bodies doing things for us, how do we ensure that we all have equal access to them over time and how do we maximize participation and agency through them over time and that's where i think sortition does a, a, a better job really um and so it's it's more of a temporal distribution of agency over time which you know in large countries if you're thinking of the of the national lotocratic body maybe you never get there maybe you know it won't rotate enough time that everybody really gets a reasonable chance of accessing it. But if you think of open democracy as something that's sort of fractal, like, you know, like it, it, it's, it's mm, happening at every level, then in your village, you have a lot more chances to be chosen and you'll get to be an agent that way there. And it's not meaningless if, if we think of it as a, you know, a, a democracy that's somewhat decentralized so that there's um, power to the people who need it at the right level and so, so, so I, I think the reason why, I, because I, it's not the first time I hear this objection, the reason why you, you sense this perhaps uh, problem is because I probably overemphasize the question of democratic representation. And that, that's just what the book is really mostly about. And I, and I downplay the question of participation and, and these mass moments of participation, but they are there and participation rights is the first principle. So agency is completely essential. Um, yes. Um, and I, and I add one thing, which is that I feel like the question of choice sometimes it seems to me more of a liberal ideal than a democratic ideal. I think equality is 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 quite essential. So you, if you have choice but you don't have equal access, what does that mean? Um, I'm sure it's so crucial. Um, and then uh, no, I, I just leave it at that because I basically agreed with everything Professor Brick said. So I, I just want to embrace it and uh, <laughs> let the, the public maybe uh, get in some questions. Great, so there is one question, it's very unfair, so I'm gonna spread the unfairness by asking all of you this question. But if we're really addressing the issue, should AI at some point replace, let's say, democratic decision-making by humans, we need to know what the value of democratic decision-making by humans consists in. So one question we had here was, you know, is democracy always good? Uh, maybe the breakdown in democracy that we're experiencing should lead us to think about non-democratic forms of government. And someone, um, Richard Veyard, put a specific twist on this kind of issue from a democratic side. He said that Professor Landmore emphasized decision-making function of democracy, but isn't that largely Herbert Simon's technocratic notion of decision-making? So, i.e., if it's about an epistemic argument, then isn't that very vulnerable to both technocratic takeover and in this imagined world, AI takeover. So what I would ask you, all of you, just if you could give a very brief statement, I know it's an impossible task, but a brief statement, where you see the value of democracy residing. And I got the impression from all of you, you weren't keen on AI taking over where there's, where there's democracy. So which of these values are the ones that show that AI would be trumped? by democracy. Helen, perhaps you could begin. Okay, so um, yeah, this, this objection that in the end, uh, epistem epistemic Democrats are in fact epistocrats in disguise, I, I get it all the time, but I guess it comes down to an assumption about the world, like it's almost an, an epistemological or ontological assumption, which is the uncertainty that we are dealing with. And I think that uh, there's something about widely distributing power that is more robust to handling this uncertainty over the long term than centralizing it in, in a you know, narrow group of people that are temporarily identified as like the knowers on certain issues because we haven't yet encountered different questions on which they have nothing to say. So I guess that comes down to that. So, so it's so essential a feature of the world for me that I just don't see how you can dissociate um, the good performance, the, the good governance from from the procedural inclusion and equality. 
it's just I just don't see. Yeah, so what if someone agreed with you about that, that there is an important instrumental connection, but mm -hmm. then they'll want to say to you, but over and above that, the process of deliberation of fellow humans with each other about what the common good is, has value, even when its outcome is um, not. I agree. But on the other hand, I, I don't think you can think totally uh, without constraints, the value of that deliberation, because if it could be proven that it's systematically disastrous, I just don't think I, I just don't think you could defend it against a, a, something that would do a lot better. At some point, you know, politics is about resolving things like famines and uh, and and so so yes, sure. I I I I'm all for the expressive value and added value of deliberation as community building. It's 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 really good and essential, but there's a constraint which is the one I'm concerned about. Prata. Um. I would actually place more emphasis on the moral and processual side of it, which is that I think the beauty of democracy is ultimately an expression of human dignity and equality. And in some senses that has to weigh so much higher, at least, at least significantly higher in whatever outcomes we envision for it, that the cognitive and instrumental gains. I mean, I, I, I mean I'm persuaded by Ellen's like, that the nice thing about democracy is that you can actually make that argument. Uh, but I would not hang democracy's fate on democracy always coming out ahead uh, uh, on that. Uh, and, 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 and that is actually my big worry in some senses that I think almost all the AI driven um, interventions to improve deliberations, uh, not only will help authoritarian regimes, but actually their argument is in some senses the beauty of AI is we now get to know what citizens' preferences are, and we can actually cater to them, at least on responsiveness, we can use AI much, much more effectively. And I think responsiveness is only one component of what a good democracy is. Andrew, um, you Here. emphasized two things. You said um, human decision-making is morally load-bearing and that it fosters commitment, and you wouldn't get that with AI. I think that's exactly right, John. But if I can, if you can see my hand, I'm trying to draw three orthogonal directions with my fingers. And, and you can think of one of the directions as the technical excellence of a decision. You know, which power station should we turn on to keep the cost down and keep the carbon emissions down, but keep the lights on? The second one is a moral dimension. What's right? And then the third dimension is commitment to it. And I think on the first dimension, increasingly the machines will always out, you know, will increasingly outperform humans, I think. On, on the second dimension, I don't think machines are capable of morally load bearing in any sense that I can understand, but they are getting better and better at learning what people's values are. And therefore they might be able to be morally load bearing, at least in the sense of implementing what those values are, though the humans will still have to come up with the values. And the third dimension, I think is up for grabs. I, I think we've talked about that a bit. You know, there are ways in which the machine learnings may inhibit uh, the participation in the process and therefore the commitment to it. But there may also be ways in which the technology can help it that we've talked about a bit. And of course, what we're trying to do is we're trying to score highly on all three axes in our decision making. Great. Helen, can I ask you some questions? These are specific to you because they relate to your theory. So the idea seems to be that open democracy, the, you, these, these are questions from the audience, very attractive ideal, but it seems to depend upon widely dispersed sites of decision making and the notion that you use many publics and so forth. So here are two objections or two concerns that came about your use of these very dispersed sites of decision-making. One is, um, this is from Ted Lechterman, how would that, wouldn't that come at the cost of some notion of collective self-determination if these decisions are being made by these mini publics rather than by something that looks like the overarching group? And the second objection says, even if you could deal with that, and this is from Gabriel Levy and Lars Lunenberg, how do you scale this up to a global level? Because a lot of these issues have to be addressed at a global level where the kind of deliberation you're talking about doesn't seem to be feasible. Great question. So I, I'm, I, 
I actually think that you, I also believe in a centralizing moment on at the relevant level on relevant questions. So for example, if you take the, the convention for climate in France, it took place at the national level. And some people said, actually, that's not the right level. This should have taken place at the European level and indeed the global level, because what are the French going to do? You know, global ch climate change is really like not something that nations as individuals can fix, but there are all kinds of arguments as to why, why we have to start somewhere. And so, so my vision is more of a, when I say a network of mini publics, I, I still want some kind of a, a, um, hierarchical principle that, that uh, uh, you know, decide that th there's, so, so you have all these like regional um, assemblies that feed the national assembly, but the national assembly is eventually where the content is processed and the decision is made and then perhaps validated by a nationwide referendum or, so I don't see it as a completely anarchical and distributed in, in the way that the question assumes. Um, and how do you scale this up? Well, the beauty of random selection, it scales very nicely. So you can do it at, the, at any, any level. And in, in particular, you could do it one day at the global level and activists and all kinds of academics are already trying to make that happen. For example, John Dreisek um, at Canberra University has a whole team of people who've been raising funds to, to make a global citizens assembly take place on the topic of genome editing, for example. Uh, and of course, climate change would seem to be another one of those big issues. I think, uh, I think it's gonna come. I think uh, European, at the European level, they're already talking about it. So I think, you know, it's very important that it happened first, uh, that it happens bottom up, that, that first it happens in, in, in uh, you know, Iceland, then perhaps France, then, then um, the UK, and now Scotland, uh, next Germany, I mean, Germany also already, already took place. And then you build on what we, we learn in these experiments and, you, and then you scale. I think that's ideal. Um, as a process. I don't know if we have, so, so I was, I did, I don't disagree with Pradap's emphasis on, on the non sort of uh, instrumental um, benefits of, of democracy. And just want to emphasize that when I say epistemic benefits myself, I, I don't think just of a factual capacity to identify the truth. I, I include a moral dimension as well. So, so it, it's broader than, than what's usually understood by that. No, but I think the question is whether the participation has value even if it's not hitting the target, either on the factual. Or yes, the it does. It does, of course. But it certain for, for certain questions, we, for example, um, if it, you know, if it, if it didn't work, and we are under a time constraint, like for 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 climate change, you do you have to worry that uh, this this you just you have it's a trade off. I guess you have to find the sweet spots where you can accept the the non-productivity of the process for the, for the sake of other values that are actually, you know, very good in themselves, but then depends on a lot of conditions and circumstances. And Let me ask uh, to anyone who wants to take this question, a more practical um, question, that is, how can AI help mitigate the rise of fake news and target ads that threaten democratic processes? Is this a question for me? Anyone. Oh, I'll, I'll, I think Professor Briggs maybe will <laughs> wrap that up. <laughs> well, uh, it may be uh, quite good at it. It may be faster. It may be better at um, fact-checking. Um, but it, it's what I said earlier about an arms race, because as fast as the AI gets better at detecting it, so the generators of, um, oh, I don't know, false videos, you know, someone who makes a video of me saying something I didn't say at all, they'll get better at it too. And they'll get better at outwitting the AI that's capable of detecting it. So I, I think we are going to see a competition here. And I think it's quite serious, actually. And it's going to need a combination of the technology, of regulation, and of individual alertness and um, awareness. Anyone with any further thoughts on that? Let me ask one question. And you talked about an AI arms race. There's also a potential AI arms race between countries. Is, is there any prospect of a, anything approaching a democratic resolution of that massive problem? Or is that a point at which we step outside of democratic politics? Pratap, perhaps you might have some thoughts on this. Um, I mean, so, so, so I think two quick things, right? One, of course, is the paradox that, um, you know, it was that moment of globalization that partly opened up this sort of semi-utopian vista, right? Um, and we thought technology and globalization would go together. And now in a sense, they're going in opposite directions. And uh, in some ways, the risk uh, 
of AI becoming the bone of geopolitical competition means that it probably has the same kinds of risks that we used to think about in terms of nuclear competition about 40, 50 years ago. And, and there are no common conventions. I mean, just in terms of, you know, uh, sure, they might not annihilate humanity, but they can certainly cause incredible displacement and so forth. Um, and the fact that there's very little multilateral negotiation on this, I think that is deeply, deeply uh, worrying. Uh, and I think it's also worrying because it is happening at the moment, going back to the democracy question, where I think the 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 geopolitics is going to be embedded once again in perhaps a somewhat exaggerated, but still a construct of authoritarian versus democratic regimes. And we know that those conflicts have always been dest destabilizing. So it's something to worry about. You've got um, different regimes actually in different parts of the world. So you've got, um, you know, the sort of thing you've got in America where it's almost unregulated and it's almost entirely run by the big data industries. And you've got China where it's almost entirely run by the government. And you've got the you've got Europe with the GDPR that's sort of somewhere in between the two. So we're already seeing different kinds of structures in different parts of the world and frayed with little um, prospect of harmonization or agreement between them. Wendy Hall at Southampton's got a book coming out about this next year, worth reading. Excellent. Ellen, I'm going to give you the last word if there's anything you want to raise or conclude with. No, I just wanted to thank you so much for uh, making me think harder about, uh, about this. It was really, really a great opportunity. And, uh, and I, yeah, I look forward to more conversations. Thank you so much. And that was a fantastic talk. And thank you also to our commentators, Pratap Banu Mehta, Andrew, Br Andrew Briggs. And thank you, everyone, um, for joining us today. Well, thank you all. I've so much enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for what each of you has contributed. And thank you, Elaine, for really stimulating our thought. Thanks. Thank you, Elaine, John, Andrew. Thanks. <laughs>